Hi folks, it's time for another Wednesday's River Bible. So remember, this is some of the most important work we do in our church. I beg you and plead with you and urge you, God's promises are strong, to work through us, to see the people on our witness hit list and people not on it, saved and discipled and growing strong in Jesus, just like us. Please guys, please join us in prayer. Uh, today's Wednesday's River Bible is called, Now is Our Time. Let me read this and then we can pray. A socially successful. An astute reader of this prayer letter asked for clarification of a term I used in the last one. I was grateful to provide some additional insight into what I meant by the term socially successful churches. As we interacted, his helpful observations got me thinking a bit more deeply about why I think this term is so vitally important in our gospel witness. By socially successful, I'm, I'm not referring to uh, any church over 100 people. Uh, I'm referring to churches considered such successful based on secular measurements without regard to other considerations. Speaking in general terms here, which means there can be exceptions to the rule, guys. Socially successful churches are known for having big body counts, big budgets, and big buildings. The reader rightly observed that such measurements are not in and of themselves bad. That's true. The first New Testament church in Jerusalem had a membership in the multiple of thousands, possibly well over 10,000. While they did not have a lot of money, nor a lot of property, as the book of Acts makes very clear, this big number, the big body count, was a true measurement of spiritual success. And it is something all of us should long for. Indeed, that is one of the things we pray for as we pray through these prayer letters. Yet my observation here is that these triple bigs, bodies, budgets, and buildings, are the primary measurements used by our society to measure whether or not a church is successful, hence the phrase socially successful. Uh, uh, in other words, America's definition of success is in view here. Uh, quote, well, if they've got a big body count, a big budget, and a big building, then they must be doing something right. And while there are certainly biblically successful churches that are also marked by these big threes, the majority of such churches are not similarly marked by the Bible's measurements of success. And I refer you to a Wikipedia article, List of Megachurches in the United States, and then you can click on that table, sort it by attendance, and you'll see what I mean. Most of these churches, those with multiple thousands in, membership, in attendance, excuse me, are considered evangelical. And given their doctrine, that should really, really concern us. My argument, though, it may provoke you in the wrong way, is that most of these churches are not teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, but instead one that has the appearance of godliness but denies its power. The gospel taught by these churches is a pragmatic one that teaches people to rely on their own self-efforts instead of Christ. How foolish can you be, Colossians, or Galatians 3.3 tells us, after starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human efforts? This is not a debate about differences in denominational distinctives or secondary doctrine. Certainly, some of these churches are truly saved and walking by Spirit-powered faith. Yet, they do so not because of the discipleship in the gospel that they're being taught. Instead, God is merciful and works through weaknesses. But this is no excuse to go along with this state of affairs, listen to Galatians again. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. Again, I say, as I've said before, if anyone preaches another gospel than the one you welcome, let that person be cursed. A gospel killing three. Such churches are marked by three chief gospel killing characteristics. Presumptive language prosperity focus, and present revelation. In this first character, listic, these churches will use Bible words. Sitting in a worship service in one of them, a person will hear of Jesus, of sin, and even of faith. Yet they use these words out of their biblical context. When their usage is just repetition of meaningless phrases, it can be relatively harmless, at least for the person with their credible faith who will presumptively fill in the blanks, and come away thinking more or less of the gospel that the Bible teaches. Yet for those who don't know the Bible's gospel, the meaningless uses of phrases yields frustration, and in time, 
these folks find that their faith doesn't work, and so they give it up. Worse than this, though, are those churches which use the right words, but then explain them with a system of belief that is anything but biblical. Discipled under these twisted gospels, folks have been made double slaves of Satan. I'm echoing Jesus' warning about the Pharisees in Matthew 23, the original pragmatists. In the second of these gospel-killing characteristics, these churches teach that the gospel is focused on prosperity. This is more widespread and subtle than a crass, obvious prosperity gospel. Such churches teach that the gospel is focused on blessing people with their best lives now. Their best marriages, their best child raising, their best careers, their best retirements, even their best experience in their church. In other words, these churches teach that the gospel is about a person's prospering in this world. In other words, human thriving. Something that even the unbeliever longs for. In these churches, no one will ever hear about the, the deep, all-pervading, all-encompassing wickedness of man. Instead, they major on teaching you that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life in this world. Now, it is true that there's nothing inherently wrong with these prospering bests, yet the gospel is not about our thriving here and now. The gospel is not about us, but Jesus. It is about his success, his prosperity, and his glory. And if any of these things are not desired for only Jesus' glory, you can be guaranteed that you've been taught idolatry in one of these churches. In these churches, one will never hear about the essential role, for example, of suffering in the Christian life. One will never hear of dying to self, of taking up one's cross. These folks are not taught that God is more interested in their eternal prosperity, their thriving with Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth, than he is in their momentary comforts in this world. In the last of the big three gospel-killing characteristics, these churches root their errors in the practice of present revelation. Giving lip service to the doctrine that the Bible is complete, they twist Sola Scriptura by teaching that the Spirit speaks direct words of God to each individual believer. From teaching believers to hear the Spirit speaking through automatic writing, um, excuse me, to reading the Spirit's will in Christian tarot cards, the astounding range of practices teach one thing. God's Word is to be known through the Spirit's personal, present revelation to the individual. Ascribing the most atrocious lies to the lips of the Spirit. The Bible is best a book taken out of context to offer fabricated proof for the various heresies of these new revelations of the supposed Spirit. I recognize that making broad, general sweeping assertions of these is fraught with the danger of one good example dismissing everything I've said. Yet increasingly that fear does not persuade me to find a more judicious way of making these warnings. The evangelical branch of the church in our land, the part that is supposed to have the best grip on the gospel, is all but dominated by big churches that promote these gospel-killing three errors. Now, brothers and sisters, now. Now more than ever, we need to fall down before God and plead his mercy on us. We need to be wary of falling into the various us-versus-them traps Satan uses when God's people begin to observe something is stinking up the church. We need to plead for our own humility, looking for where we might be guilty of devaluing, defacing, or detracting the gospel of Christ. We need to pray for the courage to stand up, motivated by love for God and those listening to these flawed, failed, false gospels, and say, no, that is not the gospel. As more and more children of evangelicals and other branches of the church enter adulthood and abandon their gospel birthright, now is time to learn the true gospel better and better and better. Now, brothers and sisters, now is our time. Thanks for considering these things. And as serious as these needs are, much more significant and potent and majestic and almighty, God is ready to answer us with good and great news. So maybe we should pray to him. Dear Lord, some of us have majored in arguing over minor issues, leading some to discount the purity of your gospel. Some of us have been far too complacent, allowing obvious wolves into your flock, tearing at your children with their false gospels. Forgive us and teach us your true gospel. Then use us to take it to others. 
Restore to us the years the locusts have eaten. Pour out your spirit of revival on us for your glory with your Father and your spirits as well, we ask. Amen. That's it, brothers and sisters. Hope you that you join us in prayer. Um, remember, Wednesdays at 7 and, and 12. You can do that via uh, the freeconferencecall.com or Thursday mornings at uh, 7, uh, or excuse me, 6.30. You can join us at that uh, face-to-face um, or on the freeconferencecall.com. Until I see you again, may God's grace and mercy grow in your life uh, through the work of the Spirit who teaches you to put to death your flesh by repentance and bring to life your love for God through faith. May He be present to work and grow you in the gospel. May He bless you with all strength and mercy. And until I see you again, love you. God bless. Bye-bye.